because I've had the opportunity to speak with many leaders such as yourself, uh, individuals from the C-suite, heads of NGOs, uh, Olympic gold medalists, uh, lots of leaders. And what has been unique and constant for each is that their journey, their personal journey that led them to a position of influence and power all had a deep influence on how they governed, how they led people, how they managed innovation and change in the workplace. Can you tell us about the evolution of your personal journey? What has happened during your life that has led you to be the type of leader that you are, and in particular, one that has a focus on purpose-driven and innovative leadership now? I grew up on the east side of Detroit, um, oldest of six in a 1,000 square foot house, and um, all of us in seven years. So we were, mom was Irish, dad was Italian. <laughs> um, went to public schools, um, went to Wayne State University, mm -hmm. flunked out twice, uh, my second time with a 1.79 grade point average. So I went to work in the auto plants. I did rear axle differential housing assembly on the Mercury Bobcat. Was really good at it. Um, and uh, while working one day, my union steward came along and I changed my job flow. Um, and he said, you can't do that. That has to go to the union committee because it's a work role. And we argued because um, it was easier for me. And I pointed my finger at him and I said, how do I get your job? I'm standing there with earmuffs on, earplugs, goggles, hard hat, gloves, overalls, heavy work boots, smoking a cigarette. Marble Reds, loved them. And um, <laughs> I said, how do I get your job? Because he's standing there in his khaki pants, white shirt, and a red tie. Uh, and he said, you got to have a degree. And so I went home, looked at the course book, looked at the classes I passed, looked at the classes I could have passed if I just attended them, I um, looked at the classes I should never take again, and my quickest way out was an accounting degree. Um, and the story started to race off from there. I went to Cornell University for my MBA, mm -hmm. um, went to work um, in starting up my own company um, in Detroit called Select Care. Um, we sold that um, 10 years in. I retired, um, went to New York Life. Um, out of retirement after my family was tired of me hanging around on my motorcycles and drinking beer all day. And um, we took Express Scripts Public, that was a New York Life company, we sold New York Life to Aetna, and then all the wheels started to fall off. Uh, my son got sick with an incurable cancer, he was 16 years old. I quit my job, moved into his hospital room with him and lived with him there for almost a year. Um, put him in hospice, um, found a cure for him. Um, and he is now 31, only one to ever survive his cancer. Um, nine years ago, I gave him my left kidney because he needed his kidneys transplanted from the cure. Um, and that began my sort of view of how the healthcare system really worked. Because when he went home, he was cured of his cancer. He had you know, kidney disease or his kidneys were damaged by the cure and we, were, we had a very fragile existence. And then when they finally gave out, you know, I gave him my left kidney, that whole journey, they were happy that he was just cured of his cancer. But he wasn't the person he was when he went in to the program where he was a star athlete, you know, starting half back on his football team at school, um, lacrosse player. And so his whole life had changed. Um, a year into his recovery, I broke my neck extreme skiing, broke it in five places, lost most of the use of my left arm. Um, ended up in a coma for a week. And when I woke up out of my coma, as soon as I was able to go home, they sent me home. But I was in chronic pain. I was on seven different narcotics. Tried to go back to work and realized that um, um, I needed a different version of what healthy was. Uh, and I ended up going to a cranial sacral therapist. Um, I started using acupuncture. I still carry my own needles when I have a lot of pain. Um, I still have chronic neuropathy. My left arm burns all day long. It never stops burning. So if you see me grabbing, it's because it's distracting me. Um, um, did, got into yoga, meditation. Um, I do yoga, meditation, and Vedic chanting every morning before I go to work. And so I'm experiencing this whole evolution of getting away from don't take any narcotics or, or medication for my pain. And, got, and felt, wow, this is really like an amazing experience. You know, finding the inner self, understanding the journey, um, controlling my pain. So I came to work in 2007 at Aetna and I just became president. And I said, I want everybody to do yoga and meditation. <laughs> and um, the chief medical officer came to me and said, nah, I, I think this is like voodoo medicine. And so I said to Lonnie Reisman, 
Um, uh, I said, Lonnie, you know, what if, what would we need to prove in order to say that this worked? And so we did a double blind study um, with people on the West Coast and the East Coast. People on the West Coast were actually more stressed, which I found amazing. Um, and um, we looked at <laughs> quintiles of stress, um, heart rate variability and cortisone levels. And um, people with the highest quintile stress had $2,500 a year more of healthcare costs. Um, 12 weeks later, their stress dropped in half. Our healthcare costs went down. But more importantly, the journals told us these incredible stories of families that where lives were saved, where somebody was committing, considering committing suicide, and, and marriages were saved. And, and in looking at that whole program, it cost us $179,000. And it was an amazing journey, which has started our whole relationship, very different relationship. We've had 16,000 of our employees have now gone through the program with great results. Yeah. So that was the start. Um, that was the, sort of the evolution, the, the awakening, if you want to call it, the enlightenment. Right. Uh, so what an amazing story. Uh, I can see how that would influence who you are and how you lead. Uh, you've already given an example through yoga. So my question would be next. Let me give you some context. So we do a lot of studying here mm -hmm. of the trends in the new workforce. We look at the pipeline. Who's coming through the pipeline from millennials all the way through post-retirement? What is their profile, trends in their profile? What are trends and what motivates them? One of the things that we're seeing is because the profile is shifting so dramatically and because the, trains, the trends in what motivates them to want to go to work and work for specific places, we're seeing shifts in what is expected of leaders. Right. Okay? Um, we saw in the last couple of weeks a phenomenon in Philadelphia. So uh, Kevin Johnson, who's the CEO of Starbucks, yep. had to deal with a crisis. Uh, we all know that there were two African Americans who were arrested in one of their stores and there was a lot of current controversy over those arrests and a lot of questions about the training that takes place for Starbucks employees. So what Kevin Johnson has done is to engage experts in the fields uh, that study racial bias, unconscious bias in particular, and they are going to close 8,000 of their stores mm -hmm. for an afternoon to allow all of their employees, domestic employees here in the United States, to receive training on uh, unconscious bias. My own research looking at learning and development of people in organizations shows that clearly when you invest in your people for the skills that they need, whether it's at a Starbucks or whether it's at Aetna, mm -hmm. uh, is hugely beneficial to not only attracting employees but retaining them and having them feel happy about the work that they do and confident in that work. Social activism, though, in this particular case, is one of those traits and attributes of a leader that the new population of employees, particularly millennials, are looking for. Do you consider yourself to be an activist leader? And if so, why? Yeah, I am. So I um, started at, um, um, on Twitter in 2007, uh, and I'm, I'm at MTBERT. And my daughter happened to be working for Gawker Media at the time, and she saw me sign up, and she sent me this note going, Dad, don't do it. <laughs> um, and I said, I'm going to do it. And so she taught me about how Twitter's about listening. Uh, and, and so I immediately, within a month, I got engaged with a student in um, Arizona who had bought a coverage policy that was only up to $300,000, um, and he had colon cancer, and he ran out of his, he hit his cap. And so he started tweeting at me about how much his bills were, um, and it was Poop Strong was his name um, on, uh, on Twitter. Yeah. And I started engaging him, and all of a sudden, you know, I had this swarm all over me of people saying, what are you going to do about it? So I DM'd him and got behind the scenes and said, I'm working on this. We'll take care of it. And I asked the team, how many students are in these programs that have caps? And it was interesting. Arizona State University was the only university that bought these policies for, with caps in them because they were cheaper for the students. So we found five students were in this situation. So I called the university president up and I said, pay me the premium for the higher policies for these five students and we'll pay all their bills, which is what we did. And, um, and I told, you know, um, I won't use his name as Poopstrong, I told Poopstrong um, <laughs> that, um, 
I was going to uh, do this. And he said, thank you all my Twitter followers. You forced the CEO of Aetna to do this. And so I DM'd him and said, you know that's not what we just did, right? Yeah. And he apologized to me. And that began a whole program where I now have 30, uh, they call them Mark's Minions, um, Twitter reps that work nothing with me all day long on Twitter solving problems. Mm -hmm and being social activists. Um, so we donated to the, to the march for our lives. Um, um, we, um, um, I'm now a, um, a straight ally in the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and some of my peeps are there in the back row from the NGLCC, um, where we have taken positions of, of social, on social issues that most corporations wouldn't. When the um, nightclub in, uh, in Florida was attacked, We've, every October 11th, we fly our, the, the gay pride flag over the building. And when um, the nightclub was attacked, we flew the flag and opened the church across the street for all of our employees to go pray. We lost two, two of our employees in that attack um, down in Florida. So the interesting thing is, is all the millennials want is they want to know people, planet, then profits. And if we take care of people and planet, Guess what? The profits actually happen. So we've started 3,358 farm beds over the last three years across in urban areas across the United States to feed people who don't have food. Um, our employees do um, um, giving. We match up to $5,000 in employees, so $7 million a year. We match our employees giving through our foundation. And we really do have a mission orientation in the, in the, in the program. And we take care of our own. That's, that's amazing work that you all are doing at, at Aetna. In my book, Learning to Succeed, yeah. the research hypothesis talks a lot about how the global changing economy and the s rapid speed to market shifts and all the technological change, the world is changing. The mm -hmm. business environment is very rapidly changing. And so the hypothesis is companies can no longer succeed by having a strategy alone. Right. You have to have a competitive strategy and you have to have an organization development strategy developing people and put those two things together. Mm -hmm. So if your organization has a strategy and you identify what the skills are that your people need and you give them the tools to do those skills, then it will work. Right. What is the best practice that, that you have? Because I understand from what you've already said and from talking to you before that people are important to you, to your organization. Mm -hmm. You see it as integral and valuable to your organization's core mission and to the bottom line. Yeah. So people and culture matter. How do you work with your CHRO, your Chief Human Resources Officer, to be able to do the things that I write about, to be able to take your competitive strategy, yep. to develop a learning agenda, so that ultimately you have a learning organization where people are empowered, the culture is strong, people have the skills they need to do the job, they can adjust to rapid changes. So people and the people strategy is not the human resources department's responsibility. It's our leader's responsibility. Sure. And, and so when I hear, well, you know, I don't have enough human resources support, I say, well, then you're not in the world. Um, I, um, this yoga thing we did, these journals, I started reading these journals, and I found out about all these families that were struggling. So I said to my CHRO, I want to know who these people are. Um, I want to know what their lives are like, where they live, you know, what kind of struggles they have. And it took me way too long. It took over a year to get the, yeah. the data, right? And, um, and we found out that you know, it was mostly single mothers, 81% um, women, mostly single mothers. Um, they were making about $12 an hour. Um, they couldn't afford our own insurance for their dependents, so they had 30% of the kids were on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. 20% of the families are on food stamps. And I said, here we are, this major corporation. We're really successful. Um, um, we've got a great culture, but we're not taking care of these folks. And there are 5,700 of these employees. And so I said to the team, what are we going to do about it? And so I gave them Thomas Piketty's book for Christmas that year to read um, about capitalism in the 21st century. I said, this is a solution. What's ours? And we decided that we were going to raise the minimum wage from 12 to $16 an hour. And because we, when you did that, you pushed people into different benefit plans. We wiped out health care costs for all of our employees under 300% of the federal poverty level. And that impacted 7,000 employees in total, where their personal disposable income went up by, on average, 
I mean, I, it was free hugs time in the hallway whenever I'd walk down the hall. <laughs> Um, and, and the amazing thing about it is, is our employee engagement went up 1,200%. Not just in the population we helped, but in the whole organization, we're proud to be part of a company that takes care of the weakest links among them. And, and it cost us about $50 million a year. Our stock price at the time was $70 a share, and today it closed at 175 So we didn't get hurt in our earnings, um, our retention of our employee, our, our customer base went up. And so the whole mentality, it, was, it gave the organization permission to innovate around how to take care of each other. And so now we increase our tuition assistance program up to $5,000, we pay back student loans up to $10,000, um, we pay people um, $300 to sleep 20 nights in a row for seven and a half hours, um, we have pet therapy, um, and we do yoga and, and, and mindfulness for free. And you know, the pet, I've only said no once when we went from dogs to cats to gerbils to rabbits, and then somebody said, let's do mini ponies, and I said, no mini ponies in the building. Um, but we now have all these programs that are just, you know, the, the, the curiosity and the compassion and the ideas, not of me, I didn't have to push any of it. As soon as I did this one program, the whole place took off and said, how can we take care of each other? So we now have PTO banks where we donate our PTO to people who are having difficulties at home and need time off. And so you know, we give away, I give away my extra PTO every year um, to the bank for people that need it. Um, we have all sorts of, we, we have money for our employees who can't help make bills uh, pass. And so we do all this thing in the company and it builds this esprit de corps, again, people planet and then profits and the bottom lines never stopped giving um, and so the bottom lines a result of really good business fundamentals built off the people who are in, in your organization so it would be my story and I'm sticking with it <laughs> it's a good story so it sounds like with all of those initiatives some of them some of them are benefits some of them are learning for skill development in all cases, the people are responding well they're responding yes. well personally they're responding well by the returns for the business. Yet and still, I was glad to hear that you said that this is not the human resources department or right. CHRO's responsibility. This is leadership's right. responsibility. So as chairman of, C of Aetna, chairman and C uh, CEO, how do you still maintain, though? Because there will be people in the crowd, and there are naysayers that, out there that would say, that's a good fad. I can see how you did it for a little while. But when the times get tough, right. it's going to be hard to continue to do that. So how will you, in the boardroom in particular, and with your leadership team, continue to prioritize the learning initiatives, the benefits for your people yeah. so that they continue to stay motivated, that you retain their employment, and then they continue to do what you have said is your belief, which is if you take care of them, then they will take care of the business. How do you maintain that focus with the leadership team? Well, it's, you know, the, the, the so when the leadership team took a little while to bring along, uh, but once we started doing it, they said, what more can we do? And we never have arguments about um, what can we do to support our people inside the organization. As it relates to the board, I've never asked them for permission. I only ask them for forgiveness. Um, <laughs> it's one strategy. Uh, yeah, and it works <laughs> as long as you deliver the results, right? And so you have to be passionate about not only the idea but the execution of it. So in the middle of all that minimum wage benefit program, my CHRO started arguing with me that I was giving things away. And she is no longer with us. And I got another CHRO. Um, so, you know, um, I was, you know, I kept going, well, why aren't you pushing me? Why am I pulling you along? Um, the other thing is, is we blew up the spreadsheet. So spreadsheets are the greatest pox upon business. We've destroyed the Japanese economy. We're about to destroy the Chinese economy because of spreadsheets. Because with spreadsheets and auto calc, you can change the numbers in any field to get the answer you want in the bottom. And then what I have to do as the CEO of the company is find out where people played with the assumptions in the spreadsheet to get the answer they wanted. Instead of spending time talking about the assumptions, laddering the risks behind those assumptions, and changing the conversation to what is not, not what is truth, but what do we need to believe as a team to assume these risks to do these good things and make these investments. And so that's how I approach it with the board. These are great investments. We make mistakes all the time, but if, as long as we continue to be mindful about the investments we make, set, develop a set of beliefs about what we need to do to manage the risks, 
because any well laid plan, any great strategy, if you look at any great company, the plan they started with was not the plan that they ended up with that was successful. It was paying attention to the execution as you go along, learning from the marketplace and shifting your approach until you get it right. And if you have that level of diligence, and I'm an operations person at heart, I was an assembly line worker, I love watching the parts move down the line. As long as I can see the execution happening and we, we reposition as we go along, we're going to be just fine. So let's shift now from taking care of your employees yeah. for bottom line benefit to gaps in the workforce. So McKinsey recently put out a report that said that automation, machine learning, mm -hmm. robotics, and also retirement mm -hmm. are likely to lead to a 25% drop in the workforce in the insurance industry by 2025. Mm -hmm. Microsoft, uh, earlier this year, came out publicly with a stance towards protecting the benefits and the employment of their employees and, more broadly, in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. They have come forth to say we are staunch advocates of protecting our employees, even though we are in the tech industry, <laughs> creating the tools and the robots and the machines that will replace people. Our new master's degree in insurance management is going to be grappling with these issues. Um, many of our master's programs will be talking about automation, machine learning, robotics, artificial intelligence. But in the insurance industry in particular, where it's most likely to be affected, we're going to be focusing on that yep. in the degree program. So how are you and your leadership team thinking about the loss of the workforce in this industry in the future? I don't think it's a loss of the workforce. It's a repositioning of the workforce. Um, I'm on the Verizon board, so we're playing with 5G, which you know takes augmented reality and artificial intelligence to a completely different level with computing on the edge and and you know um, one millisecond of latency, right? So um, very interesting stuff. Um, what what we've lost in the industrial revolution, the information revolution, the knowledge revolution is community. And one of the places we thought we had found it is on social media, but we're now realizing that we've been manipulated um, in our community. And I think um, what we've found with social ecosystems, and this is a little bit heretical, so you'll have to follow the bouncing ball, but with social ecosystems and economies, our governments can never get big enough to control them now. They're so widespread, and they're so interconnected. And you know, we could try to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's called the New World Order, which scares everybody, including me. Or we can go back to community. We should think about how we spend our time. And wouldn't it be great if we looked after a neighbor? We're doing an experiment right now with Meals on Wheels. We built an app for their phones. They have 2 million people in homes three to five days a week. And what, what Ellie Hollander, their CEO, will tell you is it's not about the food. It's about the socialization. What if we had an app on all of our phones that said if we have a neighbor or a friend or just somebody in the street who we know has got a social issue, their lack of mobility, lack of sentience, um, lack of accessibility, food and water, and we actually could push a button and say we can help this person. Because right now an ER visit on average costs $30,000. That's more than enough to cover health insurance for a family of five for a full year. But it also allows us to invest in social determinants, which now determine 60% of our life expectancy, like food, like water, like ramps and homes, like socialization, like meals, um, like heating assistance. All of that's cheaper now than one ER visit. We had a lady in Camden, New Jersey, $2.7 million a year of health care costs, 75 years old, asthmatic, Finally went to 405 ER visits in one year. So that's more than one a day for those of you that can do the quick math. Went to her home, thermostat at 60, blankets and sweaters all over the place. She loves Angora. She's allergic to Angora. <laughs> so when we think about social determinants, investing in those social determinants, buying all new sweaters and blankets, a lot cheaper than 405 ER visits. And so as we think about this mentality of community, getting back home and changing the way we work, and letting the machines do the work that otherwise would have occupied more of our time than we want to give away, um, I think would be a big idea. The last thing you will ask on your deathbed is whether or not you should have spent another hour on a conference call. <laughs>
<laughs> so you spoke earlier about social media and how that business model is being disrupted. Yeah. And we know that Facebook is defending their business model. The whole technology industry that's focused on social media is looking at the technology ad space differently. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook has been criticized for violating privacy protection uh, norms. Um, so the business model is being changed. And we have a new master's program in human capital management, as you know. And we are going to be training these students how to adapt to changes, whether it's regulation, whether it's social activism, whether it's technological, global economy, force majeure, whatever it is, yeah. there's going to be a lot of changes. And so how can our graduate students adapt to these changes and be able to prepare the workforce to be able to respond quickly? So what would your advice be to our students here today and on film for how you can respond yeah. to very quick strategic shifts that an organization makes where their skills need to adapt very quickly. So we all know about how industry has changed, the industrial revolution. You used to be able to go to high school, you could get a job, you would have to maintain that skill for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now the skill that you develop may only last for one term, you know, half a year, yeah. right, from quarter to quarter. So what response would you have for our students in helping them prepare for that kind of changing world? So if you're going to lead in that changing world, you have to have a personal practice. You have to be present in the moment. Because the thing we lack throughout society right now, just spend any amount of time on my Twitter feed, looking at all the trolls attacking me every day for who they think I am versus who I am, there's no self-regulation. We have lost our ability to self-regulate. And the only way you self-regulate as an individual, which means your intention is tied to your action. And there's nothing hidden between it, it's transparent. When you tie your intention to your action transparently, you are a much different person than when you can hide behind an anonymous name or say things on Twitter behind an anonymous name or say things to people you don't know or you think you know um, and make accusations that are just completely baseless. And so I think there's a, and, and, and this gets all the way back to reading in schools. My better half, Mari, she teaches in public school 157 up here in Harlem where 85% of the students in third and fourth grade are two grades behind in their reading levels. And the biggest problem she has is the ability to get them to focus and pay attention. Self-regulation. And she's a yogi. She trained under Deskachar and Krishmashari in India in the, in the 80s. And you know, she's trying to teach them self-regulation and mindfulness and being present in the moment. And I think every employee workforce should have that, that self-regulation. Because when you're self-regulated and you're present in the moment, then the next step is more apparent and more real for you. And as leaders, you can direct the organization to be better. So in my meetings, I ban all electronic devices. We talk to each other. We regulate our meeting by energy, not time. To, so we get to the right answer for all those people that we need. We have 50,000 employees and families and all of our vendors that rely on us. So, I would suggest that your role in the workforce is to help first people have self-regulation. They're easier to teach them and reskill when they're present in the moment. Um, and, and, and I think that's all the way back to schools, elementary level, getting kids up to reading level so that they can be effective in, in society. We're now seeing in the opioid epidemic where 80% of all opioids created in the world get consumed by Americans which is enough to keep all of us stoned for six weeks continuously, um, is how much the United States takes in opioids, is a loss of hope and a loss of ability to be reskilled and work in the workforce. And that's because we don't have people that are educated well enough to reskill. They'd rather stay with their clan, and they'd rather be in their community where they feel safer because there are other people like them. And so we've lost our mobility. It's not the housing market. In Hartford, 75% of the housing is rented but still we have a loss of mobility. So I would really you know, push people to find a way to bring your workforce along, and it's helped us a lot as an organization. We'll never really know how 16,000 people who have gone through yoga and mindfulness have made better decisions other than our results and the feeling in the place when we run into a crisis. And you know, we had our deal blocked on Humana. The organization powered through it. We re reworked the plan, changed course, 
and everybody did incredibly well because we were focused, present, um, and paying attention to how to how to change each other and the organization to move forward. So, so two years ago, Mark, the Gates Foundation approved a policy that increased the amount of parental leave from 12 weeks to up to 52 weeks for mothers and fathers who had the birth of a new baby or an adoption, right? So paid leave for up to a year um, for, for those employees. Uh, in, a, in a Fast Company article, the Chief Human Resources Officer, Stephen Rice, discussed the positives and the benefits of what that policy has done over the last two years. It's mostly positive. Obviously, you could see how um, the retention of those employees, their level of pro productivity after they return, even while they were gone. You know, mm -hmm. it's expected that they're going to be completely gone, but they're not really, as you mm -hmm. can imagine. Other people who right. are expecting to start a family yeah. feel more encouraged to work harder while they are, um, before they have babies, etc. So, many of the people, again, here in the room, graduate students at Columbia, faculty as well, some of our organizational partners, are dealing and grappling with conceptualizing new policies or changing policies mm -hmm. to be like what Gates Foundation has done, or at least thinking about what is it that we can do with our benefits policies and our plans to help our people so that it will help our bottom line in the way, some of the ways that you've talked about. So I know that people are at the center of your leadership decision making. But when you think about policy mm -hmm. in the way that the Gates Foundation has done, are there any examples you have of radical policy shifts like that or what may be deemed as radical policy shifts? And have they worked or have they not? Well, I think you know, part of our um, work at home policy, you know, um, over 17,000 people working from home full time, or no, now it's 27,000 people working from home full time um, around the world. So we have a worldwide workforce. We pay for health care in every country in the world now. And um, when we look at that workforce, we can't regulate all of it, but we have to assume that they're doing the right thing. So it's a trust model. So building a trust model is really important. And, and you only get trust when you give it. It's like love. You only get love when you give it. And so you've got to trust people first before they can trust you back. And so we've done that in a number of areas. So your expense report, you submit it. We're not going to go through it every time to make sure you haven't, you know, put an extra bag of peanuts from the, um, you know, from the hotel room on there. But if you're cheating us, we're going to audit from time to time, and if you're cheating, we're going to fire you. So up to you. Um, and that has changed the way we think about our expense reports. Um, another trust model is we, our service people, we talked to our service people, and they said we're tired of following the rules when we're on the phone dealing with customers. Um, and they came forward and said, we have this idea. These are top five problems that we have around approving it, approving things that are a problem in our system. We'd like to be able to do that on our own while we have somebody on the phone. And one of them is you know, approving drugs when the person doesn't appear to be eligible on the system. Now, they could be not be eligible on the system because they're not eligible or because their employer screwed it up or they screwed it up in signing up. And so what they said to me was, and I thought it was very profound, if a mother of four at January 1st, you know, at midnight or, you know, 1 a.m. is staying at the counter getting a prescription for antibiotics for four bucks, what do you think the chances are she came, left her party, um, came over to the, you know, 24-hour pharmacy to steal a $4 antibiotic from us? Probably not. She probably really needs it, so let's just approve it. Now, if somebody shows up with glitter in their hair and, you know, a hat on and they're looking for OxyContin, Maybe we should ask them a few questions before we approve it, right? Because there's a rave going on somewhere that, we're, that we haven't been invited to. And so um, so um, you know, let's use our common sense. So CFO got really nervous. I said, oh my gosh, this could be like brutal. And so we did it with 500,000 lives in our business. We gave them a budget. And we said, if you go over the budget, you've got to come back to us. Well, they spent less than 30% of the budget. And now we've rolled it out company-wide. And they made their own programs, dial a friend, um, you know, all, you know, all these sorts of things, set up mechanisms in the organization to be able to answer these five things on the phone at a time. And we just had to trust them. And the result was is they were more trust. They, they took care and accountability to do it the right way and to take care of our customers. And it's had a huge impact on our, on our uh, net promoter scores and our customer service. And our employees' happiness at work, which they really want to do the right thing, right? They want to they help people. 
So let's shift now and talk a little bit about the structure of organizations. Mm -hmm. So Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, co-wrote a book called How Google Works. Yeah. And in that book, they spend a lot of time talking about the structure of the organization. Um, they talk a lot of talk about, they spend a lot of time talking about the smart creatives, you know, the quote unquote smart creatives that Google employs, uh, which is different than what most other organizations mm -hmm. hire, so they claim. And so one of the things they talk about is how most organizations, most people, would argue for a flat organization. Mm -hmm. Whereas in reality, at Google, the people want a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. They want levels for them to ascend and to, um, and to um, aspire to. There's also this rule of seven, where the ideal in traditional organizations means that you should only have a maximum of seven direct reports. Mm -hmm. But while at Google, where you have these smart creatives, their rule of seven is flipped, where they need to have a minimum of seven direct reports. So let me ask you the question, how many direct reports do you have? 13. 13, yeah. okay. So in managing those 13 direct reports, mm -hmm. how do you manage the challenge of continuing to attract new talent? How do you retain and motivate continuously those 13 direct reports that you have for the best possible outcome? So you have to know them, the 13 I'm talking about. I have to know them really well. I have to know what their lives are like. I have to know what their wishes are. I, you know, it's not, there's a, a, the ending of Tombstone, the movie Tombstone, um, Val Kilmer as Doc Holliday's laying in bed dying of consumption. And he's talking to Wyatt Earp, um, who, who is, um, I can't remember his name, but um, anyway, and, he's, and he says to Wyatt, what do, you, what do you want out of life? And Wyatt Earp says, I want a normal life. And, and, and Doc Holliday says, well, there's no such thing as a normal life, it's just all life. And so what we have to understand is there's no such thing as work-life balance, it's just all life. And so unless you're engaged in how a person thinks about the world, you can't possibly motivate them and they're all different. And you wanna have different people. You wanna have different motivations on the team. You wanna have people that actually think about how to take care of other people versus somebody who's trying to drive to the bottom line or make operations work really well. So you gotta have these different kinds of teams. Then throughout the organization, you have different groups. I have a group in Chelsea here in New York that are all data, analytics, machine learning experts. By the way, out of Google, out of Facebook, out of Apple, they came to work with us because we gave them one mission. If we save, if we figure out healthcare costs and figure out how a way to take care of better people, we save the nation's economy. Do you want to join us? And we have 500 of them. And they're all the coolest people on the planet, but they work in a different hive environment, real teaming, you know, I wear my ripped jeans and t-shirts to the office. Um, this is a little dressed up for me. And, you know, and, I love, and I love hanging out with them because they're lo looking at the coolest things. And you gotta get excited about it and talk to them about it and you gotta understand what motivates them when they're doing the work. And it's, and, and it's not necessarily pay all the time, right? And then I have other parts of the organization like actuaries, we have 200 actuaries who you know, won't let, let me play in, my, in their card games because I won't play by the probabilities, they play by the probabilities. <laughs> um, and and you know, they're, very, you know, they're very regimented, they wanna talk about the math and they wanna spend time, and you, know, and, you gotta, and you gotta change your personality to sit in the room with them. So if you looked at our organization, you'd say this is a menagerie. But that's the beauty of it, that's the culture of it, is that we're all focused on this mission of fixing the nation's healthcare problems fixing the world's healthcare problems, because by the way, every economy around the world has got a trouble with healthcare costs. It's just killing everybody. It's consuming everything. And if we can figure that out, we can save the world's economy. And so all these people, so you have to have the energy to know people, to realize it's all part of life, spend time with them. I like a flat organization in volatile times, because in volatile times, the captain needs to be up at the wheel in the storm versus down below decks drinking a bottle of wine while the rest of the crew deals with it. So we go flatter the more volatile the, the environment is because we can all have all hands on deck and we can see everything going on in the organization. And then when things settle down, which they haven't settled down since 2006 for us, you know, you can grow up again, but, um, but we go flat and really wide. So our spans of control at the front lines are 20, um, 20 people. So I recently sat down with feminist icon Gloria Steinem. No. And one of the things that she talked about is the benefits of, the characteristics of 
a mentor-mentee relationship. So when I speak with our students and our staff yeah. and our faculty, one of the things that I talk about is the value of having that kind of mentor relationship in a personal board of directors, in the form of a personal board of directors. Do you have a personal board of directors? And if so, who's on it? How do they help you? Can you give the students and the faculty an example? I'll break some convention here. I've never had a goal in my life. <laughs> and I'm running a Fortune 50 company. Um, but I've done two things. I've known myself what it is that I do really well. So I fix broken things and I build new things. I hate making the trains run on time. So I make sure I'm surrounded by people that make the trains run on time. And they love to do it. And I reward them handsomely for doing it because I don't want to do it. My kids every year say, Dad, what do you want for your birthday? I want to drive a Zamboni machine. Because I am sure <laughs> the pattern they use on the ice can't be the only one. I can improve on it, right? <laughs> so that's the kind of person I am. And, and, and so my, when I started off in my career, I got somebody to sit down and show me what my inclinations were and my derailers were. Um, I can make the trains run on time when I have to, but not for long, because I'll screw it up. And then, in the early part of my career, I went out to dinner with somebody I didn't know at least two nights a week. So my network is this huge network of people, and whenever they, and, and, and all I wanted them to do was call me. If you got a problem, an idea, an opportunity, just call me. And I would listen. And so I have had one resume, my resume from when I graduated from graduate school. I have never interviewed for a job. I've only answered the phone, said, I think I can help you, and I've joined organizations. And that's how I got where I am. So I've never had to go look for work. I've never worried about being at work. I've had my network and my understanding of who I am and how I operate and connecting those two with conversations. So my board of directors is really wide, but I also have a few key people that I go to that are very different depending on what the issue is. Um, you know, I have a, um, a group of four guys that I went through kindergarten, grade school, high school, and college with, and to them I'm just Bert. Um, and you know, when I wanna just relax and enjoy life, and that's my Facebook page, that's why nobody can get on my Facebook page, because it's all those crazy people. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have my own current board of directors. I have three board members who are really great mentors. Um, you know, two, uh, Roger Farah, who's the former vice chairman of Ralph Lauren, Ed Ludwig, who is the former CEO of Beckton Dickinson, and Betsy Cohen, who is, um, started the Internet Bank, and she produced 62% of all the stored value cards in the world at one point in time. Um, and she's just this amazing woman at the age of 74 who is just brilliant. Um, I'm having breakfast with her on Saturday morning. And so, and, and they're the people I check in with to say, am I, am I being sane here? Am I doing something crazy? Um, when the, when the um, shooting happened in Parkland, we got very aggressive in Washington with people that were supported by the NRA um, and said, you need to go to work and you need, you're not gonna get our support anymore unless you change the laws. Um, and I had board members who were angry at me for that. Right, um, um, and so you know, I check in with them and say, you know, how do I do that? And then um, you know, I have my um, my my partner Mari, who um, when she first met me, um, said, you know, you're one of those corporate CEO guys. I don't like you guys. Um, you're you know, you wear fancy suits and ties all day. <laughs> um, you drive around with you know staff, and you got corporate aircraft, and you have all this money and you really don't know what it's like to, to, to be with real people. And Mari really tied me to real people. Um, so we're part of Harlem Grown here in Harlem, uh, the urban farm, and we help Tony Hillary. He's helping kids in schools and feeding families, doing five tons of food now um, throughout Harlem, supporting families. And Mari always drags me into the dirt and says, come on here, this is where the real people are. Um, get off your, you know, your, your, your high horse. Um, and, and, and be with the people. So well, it's all for different, you know, different parts of my personality need different care and feeding. So my last question for you, effective leadership requires a really strong approach to scenario planning. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to look around the corner, see what's coming next, prepare for it, have contingency plans. Mm -hmm. Many of us in this room have taught the case about Kodak. Yep. Kodak is a company that's humming along, they're doing really well. Yep. 
hefty returns year after year, and then all of a sudden, boom, boom, digital photography wipes them out. What is it that concerns you now, assuming that you have done your scenario planning with your leadership team, where's the blind spot? What's coming around the corner for Aetna that you need to be prepared for as a leader? So, you know, and the other interesting thing about Kodak is who had the first digital technology? Kodak. Kodak. That's right. Um, and they didn't want to cannibalize their own business. I've had conversations with a number of Silicon Valley leaders who have disrupted a lot of industries, and they'll say they never disrupted anything. What they did is they created experiences for customers that they prefer over people who are providing them services now. And it's those customers that disrupt industries because they go somewhere else. And that's where it starts. It has to start with the customer. And so we're always looking for what is the unmet need um, that the customer isn't getting today that somebody else could provide and how could they provide it. And if we're in a place where we could actually be there quicker, why aren't we doing it? And so we have a group of people, the group, group in Chelsea, a group up in Wellesley, Mass, who don't ever come to corporate. We don't want them anywhere near corporate. We'll, we'll destroy them. They'd have to be re-socialized, detoxified, <laughs> everything else before they went back out to the field. And we want them to be thinking about this stuff all day long and building new technologies. So we just launched a new technology that's called Next Best Action. Based on your data that you give us, based on your current metrics, this is the next best thing you can do today to improve the quality of your life, not just your health. Uh, and, and that is going to be really cool technology. We're piloting with a number of people. And this is a group of people up there saying, you know, if I'm walking in the world and I'm a type 1 diabetic with a hemoglobin A1C of 7.3 and it should be below 7, what should I do next to get it done? And maybe it's 10,000 steps instead of 8,000. And if that's indeed the case, how do I know I'm doing on 10,000 every day? Well, what if we have you geofence and say, you know, it's 8 o'clock at night, you've got 9,200, we know where you live, and if you go around the block four times, you hit your 10,000, and you're in. And if you do that for a month, you're below 7, and oh my God, your life's going to be a lot different, and you're going to feel better about your life. And, and so those are the kinds of things that we look for because that's the unmet need. Everybody talks about the ideal diabetic. Well, there's no ideal diabetic. There's no normal diabetic. We're all our own people. And if somebody can make it personalized about me, what I view as my barriers to being the healthy person I want to be, dealing with my neuropathy, people define their health as what it does to get in the way of the life they want to lead. And if we can solve that problem for them, we can succeed. So we spend time all the time looking for this. And is it the Berkshire Hathaway, you know, J.P. Morgan, um, um, Amazon partnership? They could do it. But we've got 54 million people that we take care of every day. And we're about to have another 100 million in our combination with CVS that, you know, we could have 150 million people in the United States that we could impact every day if we just approach them a little differently. And, and, and so it's the CEO's job to make sure that happens every day. Um, I don't lose any sleep over it. You just have good people that bring you new ideas. And I've never had to say no yet, so I don't think we're trying hard enough, as I tell them. My job is to be unrealistically expectant and patiently tolerant of progress. Uh, and I keep waiting for the no, but that's, I, that, I, that's how you do it. It's, it's not some machine. It's not a consultant. Don't hire consultants to tell you what your strategy is. It doesn't work. Um, what you need to do is you need to be engaged with your workforce, understanding the unmet need of your customer, and then finding ways to meet that need, and then execution, execution, execution. It's crawling in the mud on your belly an inch at a time to make sure it happens, and if you need to change it, you change it. That's the secret. Mark Bordellini is the chairman and CEO of Aetna. We've been talking today about innovative and purpose-driven leadership. Mark, thank you very much for joining us at Talks of Columbia. Thank you, Jason.